Good evening, everyone. I would like to call to order the Seminole County School Board meeting for October 25th, 2022. Let the record reflect that all school board members, superintendent, board clerk, and board attorney are present. And Mr. Emmons, if you would please come up and introduce our invoker today. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Beeman and my assistant superintendent, Dr. Cummings. We are here with the star of the show, have, as you've seen already, Mr. Caden Moore. He is in our VPK program at Midway. He loves math. He takes on extra challenges, and when he grows up, he wants to be a firefighter. We are also accompanied by Ms. J.D. Torres Rosero, our Rosario, our VPK teacher at Midway. So come on up, Mr. Caden. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the state of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Caden. That was amazing. Uh, Jill, do we have any acknowledgement forms? Thank you. Um, Superintendent, do you have any agenda modifications? Yes, the addendum for good cause is marked on our electronic agenda by a green flag named addendum item. Okay, school board members, agenda modification. And tonight it's member Allman, member Calderon, member Sanchez, member Krause, and then myself. No modifications, Madam Chair. No modifications, Madam Chair. No modifications, thank you. No modifications, thank you, Madam and Chair. And I have no modifications either. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda outline? So moved. Any, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We have a veterans presentation, recognition. Test, test, test. All right. It is my honor to recognize the Veteran of the Month, Timothy or Tim Tucker. <laughs> Upon graduating from high school, Tim Tucker enlisted in the armed forces and served in active duty with United States Air Forces in 2003. Tim was a 4H0X1 cardiopulmonary lab technician, a position that consisted of performing many of the heart and lung function tests that determined a patient's current condition and risk profile. While stationed in Fort Bragg, he worked at Womack Hospital and had an opportunity to return to college commissioned as an officer, commis commissioned as an officer. Tim attended the University of Florida and joined the Reserved Officers Training Program and pursued a career as a nurse. During this time, he became passionate about the value of mental health services and social justice, which led to a career change. After being honorably discharged, Tim continued his academic studies at Florida Atlantic University, where he graduated with his master's in social work. Reflecting on his decision to enlist in the armed forces as a young black man and the opportunities that it provided, he saw purpose in working with children and youth from vulnerable populations. Tim began teaching engineering through Project Lead the Way with Orange County Public Schools 
and then brought his expertise and experience and service to Seminole County Public Schools as a school social worker. He provides mental health counseling, intervention support, and mentorship to the students and families of Seminole High School with the goal of removing barriers to help them achieve their academic goals. His knowledge and experience in the United States military has helped in guiding young minds and creating opportunities. Tim is now studying to become a licensed clinical social worker, which will bring a higher standard of mental health therapy to those he supports. He also recognizes the need for stable housing as a foundational requirement for a better quality of life and works at Rescue Outreach Mission in Sanford, assisting those who are, that are homeless and most in need, many of whom are veterans of our armed forces. Tim is honored to be recognized as the Seminole County Public Schools Veteran of the Month and will continue serving the students, families, and community of Seminole County, Mr. Tim Tucker. Okay, Superintendent, we have school district highlights. Yes, we have our ramp or our um, ramp program update from Dr. Weisung and team as our focus on student achievement. Superintendent Beeman, Chair Pennock, board members. Uh, we um, are um, excited to um, talk with you tonight uh, and provide you with an update on, on our math acceleration um, efforts. Um, I'm gonna lead things off um, and kind of provide an overview and then uh, Mr. Jensen is going to share some data with you and then Mrs. Spradling will um, wrap up and talk about support for students and families. So. Um, as you'll recall, we started the math acceleration conversation last April, uh, I think at the April 5th board meeting, um, where we unveiled our new approach um, to math acceleration. And we knew at that point, launching this initiative, um, that this was gonna be exciting, but also challenging. Uh, and we told you that there would be updates along the way, and so we've reached a point where we can share some data and some lessons learned and um, talk about next steps. So that's, that's really what we'll be doing this evening. Just as a reminder, the, the context of the instructional environment that we're in, um, we have lots of new things happening in the 22-23 school year. Certainly we've got um, the um, full implementation of Florida's best standards or benchmarks for excellent student thinking. Um, specifically, um, uh, a K through 12 math implementation that includes seven new mathematical thinking and reasoning standards um, that are universal um, across a student's 13 year uh, journey to uh, a high school diploma and the opportunities that those common standards 
um, create um, for, for continuity in math um, teaching and learning. Um, we've also got um, all new um, state course codes in math, a different progression framework. Um, and as you're well aware, uh, new instructional materials that teachers are implementing. And so along with new standards and materials, you also have to completely rebuild um, the district's course frameworks um, and, and progression documents. So a lot of, of change this year um, in, in both ELA and math, but especially in math instruction. And so this really gave us an opportunity um, to think about how we are um, providing acceleration opportunities in math um, and, and to really um, extend the work that's been done here for many years, um, specifically under the um, former Primes and GEMS programs. And um, with the new standards and the, the new approach to math instruction, we really felt like a, a relaunch and a rebrand was necessary. So just as a reminder, um, our goal is always to allow um, as many students as possible um, to access um, additional accelerated math coursework. And in many districts, this is a selective opportunity. It's available at a handful of schools as opposed to all schools. Um, and so we wanted to be sure that we, we maintained um, that commitment um, to, um, to you know, wide access to accelerated mathematics. We also wanted to build a framework that really allowed for both on and off ramps at multiple grade levels. And I think in our prior Primes initiative, there was sometimes a perception that by jumping on the acceleration pathway, you, you, you were making a seven or eight year commitment all the way through Calculus BC. And I think the model that uh, Mrs. Spradling and the DTL team in, in consultation with the assistant superintendents and the principals have designed really does present um, viable on and off ramps, you know, for students and families as they make um, those decisions um, related to, you, you know, approaching college and career readiness. So, um, so both on and off ramps um, were, were, were part of the building of the progression. And again, the, the critical nature uh, and the connecting nature of the mathematical thinking and reasoning standards, um, you know, to, um, to, to ensure that as students progress through math, um, there is that, that commonality of, uh, of instruction. So um, those are kind of the, the program goals that really led to, um, to this um, new launch. Uh, as a reminder, um, there is a state model for acceleration that we certainly considered. Um, and at the end of the day, um, we decided um, as a district that um, the state model would not allow for the universal acceleration opportunities that we wanted to provide. And also that um, starting that pathway at grade three was too early um, and would require um, parents and educators um, to talk about these decisions in second grade, w w which we just felt um, from an education and curriculum perspective um, was not the best time to do that. And so the district built its own acceleration model. And again, this, this chart just shows um, um, the differences. Um, and, and I think the, the key piece is that we end up in the same place, and that is the opportunity for seventh graders to take algebra one and eighth graders to take geometry if they want to do that. Um, but how we get there is a little bit different um, from the state design. So just drilling into the um, three key accelerated courses, again, um, ramp four um, is aligned for um, assessment purposes to the fourth grade fast assessment, but we are teaching all of grade four and part of grade five. Then moving forward, our ramp five students are actually fully taking the sixth grade middle school course and curriculum and standards. And that's really the big shift for us is that we're teaching a full middle school course um, to those elementary students. That's, and that's been a shift both um, for faculty and students and families because th there are differences in the curriculum, there are differences in the materials, there are differences in grading practices. And so all of that is a shift for us. But that gets us again on a very smooth gradient up to um, the seventh grade um, accelerated course where we're covering um, um, 
part of the seventh grade, the, the key pieces along with all of pre-algebra so that those students are fully ready for algebra one in grade eight. So again, just a, a different way of getting there. Um, in terms of the 22-23 implementation, um, we're, we're pleased with um, the enrollment that we're seeing. And again, we're gonna, we're gonna share some um, data with you um, from a couple of check-in points uh, in the first quarter. Um, but the key is that we've built a framework and deployed it and, and we know that there will be opportunities to improve it. And so we are actively gathering that feedback. All of our teachers um, of RAMP and really all of our instructors with our frameworks have an opportunity to give us feedback in real time on those frameworks. And the Department of Teaching and Learning team is reviewing those feedback forms daily. And in cases where there are immediate improvements that can be made, we're updating the frameworks in real time. Um, Certainly larger changes um, will be held back for 23-24, but where we can make little adjustments, th 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 those are happening immediately, which, um, which is an incredible um, um, benefit you know, for, for our teachers and families. Um, additionally, um, focus groups are, are being constantly conducted with these teachers, and where we have opportunities to influence the, the later units in the year, that work is happening. Certainly, we're visiting a lot of ramp classrooms. Um, the, the three of us were, um, were with two more ramp teachers this morning, and I know the superintendent was at a different school going through those ramp classrooms. So um, this is a, a high priority um, at both elementary and middle um, to observe instruction, um, and to you know, inform the work that's happening. Uh, and so again, there's a real focus on continuous improvement here and we'll continue to make both short and long-term adjustments. So with, with all of that in mind, Mr. Jensen's gonna walk you through two or three data points that we can share from the first nine weeks. So at this point in the school year, um, we've now collected uh, several different data points from several different progress monitors that really gives us a nice portrait of how our students in these accelerated math programs are doing. And that's something that um, our assessment and accountability team, working with teaching and learning and Dr. Weisong, we're paying a lot of attention to this year to make sure our accelerated students are being s successful in their accelerated math pathway. And uh, the first data point that I wanna share with you is the Progress Monitor 1 data. This is from the first FAST, or Florida Assessment of Student Thinking Administration. Um, to provide some context before we show you the data, um, the PM1, or the first progress monitor, is that first new state assessment. And it's an a computer adaptive assessment that students in grades three through 10 are taking, um, or three through eight in, in um, traditional math. And the um, computer adaptive nature of it means that if a student gets a question correct, they get a slightly harder question. If a student gets a question incorrect, they get a slightly easier question. So it can triangulate kind of the level that student's at now. And it's also an assessment of the entire year's worth of course material. And so um, when you see the progress monitoring one data, it may look alarming, like our students aren't being successful, but you have to realize this is where students are at having not yet learned the material for the grade level they're currently enrolled in. And so this is them being tested on their end of course expectations. And so um, even students who performed very well on the progress one administration might only um, be a level one or level two on that first progress monitor, and then we'd expect to see significant growth on the second and then um, proficiency definitely by the third assessment of the year. And so, um, and, and of course our teachers use these for their planning to, to customize instruction in their classroom and to make instructional decisions about what uh, skills their students need in the classroom. And so we'll start by looking at our RAMP4 data. Um, this shows you on the top bar our RAMP4 cohort, and at the bottom bar, is the math grade four cohort. So our students in the traditional fourth grade math course. And you can see our ramp four students are being very successful. Again, this is the end of the year course expectations. So by this measure, 54% um, of those students have already demonstrated proficiency in those fourth grade course expectations to some degree. And um, even though that math grade four number of 81% level one looks alarming, you have to remember that even if you scored at the 70th percentile, like if you, if you took all the students in the state, if you scored in the 70th percentile, you were still marked as a level one on this exam. And so students who performed very well um, still you know, are falling into that level one bucket on this first progress monitor, and we would expect those students to be very successful as they continue in um, either the math grade four course 
or the ramp course. So we'll continue to look at this data as we go to make sure all of these students are being successful. Looking at ramp grade five, and this was uh, the data we were most interested in seeing because these are students who are taking the sixth grade um, assessment, so sixth grade math assessment. The top bar is your ramp five students. The middle bar is your math six accelerated students. So these are your students currently in middle school taking the accelerated sixth grade math course. And your bottom bar is students who are taking your standard sixth grade math course in middle school. And um, one of the interesting things about this is that um, our ramp five students, despite not having had fifth grade math, right, they've they kind of got some of those as part of their fourth grade primes course and then moved straight into a full sixth grade math course, they're still being incredibly successful on those sixth grade math standards, um, even surpassing our accelerated sixth grade math students who have taken fifth grade math. And so I think that's um, really indicative of the talent of those accelerated math students, but also the, the skill of their teachers and them working through this um, early part of the year's curriculum. And then we also have students who are in the seventh accelerated for sixth graders course. So that top bar are sixth graders who took um, the previous two years probably the primes course. Most of them probably took primes in elementary school. And now they're in uh, seventh grade math in sixth grade. And then the middle bar is that seventh grade accelerated cohort who are seventh graders taking seventh grade accelerated. And then the bottom bar is seventh graders who are taking the seventh grade standard math course. And again, you can see our sixth graders who are taking that math seven accelerated are being very successful to this point on the skills um, within that course. And so uh, we were incredibly optimistic when we saw this data and we think it's indicative that these students were ready to take an accelerated math course to start this year. The next piece of data I wanna show you is um, from the district design benchmark assessments. And so these are designed by Seminole County Public Schools. They're written um, by our assessment and accountability department, working with teachers and um, curriculum specialists, and they're aligned to our um, kind of benchmark expectations, our test item specifications that the state publishes. And um, these really inform the teacher on those acquisitions of benchmarks. And this is new to the elementary environment because we've traditionally done these in middle school and high school. Um, but now with our fifth grade ramp course taking a sixth grade class, we wanted them to take that sixth grade benchmark assessment as well. And so um, your left table uh, shows you your ramp five students compared to their sixth grade peers. And the right table shows you seventh accelerated students compared to their seventh grade peers. And um, again, our ramp courses and our seven accelerated for sixth grade course, the students have performed very well. Again, I want to kind of provide some context like a 58% is not an F, because this is, again, aligned to those end of course expectations. Like when a student takes their end of year test, a 90 isn't an A or a five, an 80 isn't a B or a four. It's, um, there's much larger bands for, for you know, a level five, a level four. And so um, we're very pleased at the, the high performance of our accelerated math students on both the uh, sixth and seventh grade benchmark assessments. Um, we also want to make sure we, in addition to kind of our test scores, we wanted to make sure that our st students were um, being successful as far as homework, in-class assessments, grades within the course, and just their academic progress within each course. And so now that we've reached the end of the first grading period, we've been able to pull um, our district's grading data, and we've been able to identify how our students are performing in ramp four, ramp five, and the seventh accelerated for sixth grade class. And you can see that in ramp four, 88% of students enrolled in that course are earning, have earned an A or a B during the first quarter and less than 1% earned an F grade. In ramp five, 81% of students earned an A or a B and less than 2% earned an F. And in seventh accelerated, we had 86% of our students earn an A and B and again, less than 2% of students earn an F grade. And so our students um, have been, have demonstrated proficiency on the standards as identified by our benchmark assessments and by the first progress monitor on FAST and they've also um, demonstrated some great success um, with their grading practices. But, you know, when, in, when, whenever a student or a teacher is enrolled in one of these accelerated courses or is teaching an accelerated course for the first time, there's absolutely 
kind of a, a learning curve that goes with it. When you first take an AP class in high school or you first take your first acceleration class, like you, you begin to encounter, you begin to stretch yourself, which is really good for our uh, students who, who are looking for academic challenge. But you know, when you kind of in first encounter those concepts that, are, that provide you with some challenge, it can be a struggle, it can be difficult, especially at an early age. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Ms. Radling, who's our K-12 math coordinator, to talk about kind of some of those um, issues students might be facing and also ways we can support them through that challenge. I'm gonna jump in as I uh, pass the clicker here, just two, two additional points for Mr. Jensen's data. The first is that our schools are, are acting on this data uh, and um, I wanna, wanna thank um, Dr. Gooch, Dr. Cummings, Mr. Senko, because as our principals have looked at data, um, they have made adjustments. And so we've had cases where students um, who were sitting in the um, standard course were, were performing well, and maybe because of a parent inquiry or a, or a teacher conference or whatever, there, there was a, hmm, maybe we really should be in ramp, and our principals have been making those moves, even at, at two schools where adi an additional section had to be built, um, which required some schedule adjustments. And um, it, it's very easy to say, no, the year has started, it's too late to do that. Um, but our assistant superintendents and principals have stepped up to make sure that students are in the right place, and that's included um, conversations, you know, with with an occasional family that where the student is feeling overwhelmed, and the data is suggesting that maybe it would be better to step back to the other course. And those adjustments have been made as well. And so I think that um, that that use of the data um, and doing always doing what's right for students is is commendable. Um, and appreciate my my colleagues for doing that. Um, the second piece is in that grading data. Obviously, part part of the challenge of this particularly for fifth graders who are taking a full middle school course at a middle school pace um, um, with, with different grading practices is some of our students are taking their first B and they're taking it earlier, but again, they're in an advanced accelerated pathway. And so part of that is just that communication of understanding that, that the expectations are higher, um, but that, but that the, the perseverance that's being built is gonna be a long-term payoff for those who do want to go all the way through the, the Calc BC and maybe beyond that. So as Mr. Jensen said, um, you know, this idea of productive struggle is common to mathematics, right? And it's really that perseverance piece through doing real mathematics that is problem solving. And, and um, productive struggle is how we create problem solvers in mathematics, right? And not just kind of rote calculators, basically. So I have a quote on the, on the, um, on the screen from Renaissance Learning, who we know very well is you know, we work with them, and it reads, mathematics is not solely about getting the right answers, it's about the process as well. Productive struggle is developing strong habits of mind, such as perseverance and thinking flexibly, instead of simply seeking the correct solution. So as Mr. Jensen said, you know, the challenges this year have been some of the first Bs, like Dr. Wysong said, and it's really getting families and, and students and teachers to realize that it's okay because you've now accelerated, you're taking a sixth grade course in fifth grade, right? Um, so productive struggle is really important to mathematics, and it's important for a few reasons. It really develops that growth mindset for students um, to where if they get the wrong answer, they can kind of learn through it, right? And they can, they can build up that stamina in mathematics that's really important, especially as they get into advanced mathematics topics where math isn't going to be as quick, it's gonna be much more complex. Right. Um, it also helps students delve into problems in diverse ways, and it emphasizes that students can learn from one another. They don't always have to learn from their, from their teacher, right, that they can have other resources, um, and that allows them to do that, and that's done often through discourse, which leads to the, the, the next one. They learn from their classmates, and through that, they identify more efficient strategies that are gonna become very useful to them as they get into advanced topics. And then finally, it, it really emphasizes that math is about comprehension. Right, you have to be able to read mathematics and talk mathematics to, to be a good mathematician, right? Or to be a more efficient mathematician, I should say. So productive struggle is something that teachers are very familiar with and um, our students become very familiar with it as they enter especially accelerated pathways. So, yeah. All right, we do have quite a few celebrations. I think you've seen that the data looks incredible. I think our students are doing wonderfully this year. Um, 
as Dr. Weisong said, the number of students in ramp four is similar to what we had enrolled in primes four, but continues to grow because I think we're finding again those the emphasis of on and off ramps, that students have choices, we don't have to lock them in, and they can, they can find a right pathway for their goals and needs. Um, nearly one third of our students in fifth grade are taking sixth grade math, right? So um, that's maximizing all those pathways that they can have once they get into middle and high school. So I think that's something really to celebrate. Our teachers have been phenomenal. They have jumped in, they are going to extra planning, they are collaborating, they are meeting outside of DTL to plan. It is wonderful. Um, they're getting to learn the content expectations of BEST, as well as those kind of instructional expectations of the mathematical thinking and reasoning standards. And I think it's, 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 really, it's really great to see. And then of course, as, as you saw with the data, we have 54% of our ramp four, 43% of our ramp five, and 64% of our seventh grade accelerated for sixth graders have already demonstrated grade level proficiency as measured by FAST PM1. So a lot to celebrate and we hope that this will continue throughout the year. So, you know, uh, for helping parents, right, if you have a child at home that is, is developing that, that is reckoning with productive struggle for the first time, right, what can, what can parents be doing to support their child as they now have entered an accelerated pathway? Um, and the first and foremost most important thing to do is for parents to be in regular communication with their child's teacher. Um, also, to encourage a student, a, 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 the student to maintain that growth mindset and to continue persevering even though math may have gotten very difficult this year, right? Um, we also recommend that while at home, students are demonstrating productive struggle there too. So, um, you know, while they're doing homework or while they're studying for an upcoming assessment, they should be checking their answers. They should be kind of getting regular feedback, both our um, SAVIS instructional materials and Math Nation, which Savis is our K-5, so that would cover Ramp 4, and then Math Nation would be for both our Ramp 5 and our 7th Accelerated for 6th grade course. Both of those platforms do offer videos, explanation videos that students can watch after they've kind of persevered through that homework or the studying, which is a really great tool, and it was what our, our teachers really liked during adoptions last year about the, the family support. And then finally, um, Dreambox is an adaptive program that we have for our K-8 and Algebra 1 st uh, students in, in high school. Um, and that is a, an adaptive program that students can use any time of day if families want their children to use. They already have access to it in Clever. And um, it gives them the skills review that they might need to fill in any gaps that, that the student or the family or the teacher feels exist. Last question, Dr. Weissong? We'll look forward to providing you with, with additional updates as we receive more data. Thank you. Calderon. Excellent presentation, but more important than that, excellent implementation. I mean, those words jumped out from that PowerPoint presentation because I saw all of that. And board members, if you haven't had the chance to visit some RAMP classes, I mean, it's phenomenal. I had True. elementary school kids teaching math concepts to a grown up that they didn't know when I walked in the room because it, there was as much excitement finally with math as there is in doing science experiments, right? The kids were engaged, they were moving through the rooms, they were explaining processes to each other. Everyone, you know, felt good about their struggles, but they all came up with correct solutions. I was just so proud of them. I would have thought I was in a middle school, but Secondarily to that, I don't know enough about our testing. Are we able as teachers to know what answers were either correct or wrong? And I say this because there's probably chunks of mathematical um, pieces that are consistent in our lower level learners or even our accelerated learners that if we could bring that down to the pre-K level, we saw a great pre-K student today, I'm sure he'd already on ramp five in first grade, but, um, <laughs> it, you know, to that end, if we could coach our younger grade teachers in this is what we see most often our kiddos are struggling with, whether they're in the lower, the standard level, or whether they're in the accelerated level, I would think that would be helpful. And I love how we're individualizing instruction per student, but I didn't know if we could see enough of the questions and answers to develop trends. 
Um, sure. Um, with our benchmark assessments, those are created by SCPS, and teachers do have access to their raw data. They use our EdInsight platform, and they see the distribution of how students answered. So not only can they see how students are answering correctly, they can see what common wrong answers are being selected, and that obviously helps guide instruction for next steps to address those misconceptions. Um, in the FAST portal, teachers are given some data so far, and we hope it'll, it'll be even more thorough with PM2 of, um, at the benchmark level. And so it kind of tells them um, if their students, each individual student is, is kind of on the way or there or not there with each, and that goes down to the benchmark level. Not to the item level, of course, from FAST, but to the benchmark level. And from a I systems perspective. my concern I'm is more for the younger grade teachers that you know maybe at the end of this year somebody a district or somewhere could bundle it together to say we need to spend more time in first grade with these concepts or second grade so we'll have a hundred percent of our kids on the on-ramp yeah from a systems perspective uh, one of the great things tiffany and her team does is they work with kelly thompson and assessment accountability they go through those item analyses for the for the tests and we use that data to make sure that all our benchmark coverage in each grade level is strong, that we're scaffolding concepts correctly, grade level to grade level, and then um, especially as we have a new curriculum, new standards, making sure that we're not missing any critical skills along the way. And so that's something that Tiffany and her team are constantly involved in. And it's also part of that uh, frameworks continuous feedback we do with teachers too, where teachers notice that a skill is being taught, and we've received several comments like this from teachers already this year, like we, we went to teach this skill and we noticed this particular element of it that students were struggling with. We, uh, we usually reach out to the teacher and then we notate that so we can um, work on that as part of our kind of frameworks revision process. And just to add, I think a future application of that um, Again, we'll center around the the, um, the MTRs, the thinking and reasoning standards, and um, I think it's an opportunity for us to build on the student-led conferencing um, piece that, that that Dr. Griffin and Dr. Cody really championed when they were here, and the notion of being able as a student over time to talk about how you're growing um, in those seven areas, um, and that's the... Um, you know, that type of feedback then I think can inform how we build activities in, in, in the younger grade levels. It also provides the opportunity for teachers to really actively process with their students about productive struggle um, and about, you know, some of the metacognitive skills that they're building um, that will strengthen their math down the road, um, even though they may not see the connections yet as learners. Excellent job. I love the fact that the student-led conferencing is back. It's something I was just getting ready to say when you were saying that. The fact that they're taking accountability and ownership and seeing where maybe their areas of weaknesses and strengths are and how they can adapt and help others is amazing. Love the fact that the benefit of immediate feedback and chunking the work together. Um, super happy Go Math is gone. <laughs> Something that I've, you know, the fact that this, the teachers are able to work with the students and individualize and, and get their strengths and weaknesses and then be able to go back into Dreambox and work with any of those skills is a huge benefit. So thank you so much and to all the teachers out there for everything that they're doing as well. And, and, like, and likewise, Vice Chair, we're, we're seeing very high fidelity to the new math materials. Um, and again, that's, that's a testament to the principals last year working on a surplus process to awesome. get the old, now unaligned materials out. Um, and, and for our teachers really diving in um, and, and leaving the old stuff behind. Uh, and um, what, what we're seeing when, when we're going out is that students are really interacting with those texts, um, and, and they are well aligned to the, to, to the benchmarks, and so we, we think that will come out in the summative test scores. Fabulous, thank you. I appreciate that you give the students the permission to struggle because I think it builds their confidence and gives them an opportunity to grow at their own pace and know that it's okay to make a mistake, and I think it makes them more confident in the end, so thank you. Thank you very much. All right, um, board members, items for discussion. Member Allman, do you have anything? Member Calderon? Not at this time, thank you. Member Sanchez? No. 
Member Krause? No comments, thank you. And I have nothing as well, so it is public comment time, Member Sanchez. Policy 0169.1, public participation in board meetings. The purpose of public participation segments of the board meeting is to allow the public to address matters within the board's jurisdiction and not for resolving individual grievances or disputes. Public comments related to education, the board agenda, and the district are welcome and encouraged. To maintain orderly conduct, the public comment segment of the meeting may not be used as open forums to discuss matters unrelated to education, to support or oppose candidates for public office, including presentation of political and or campaign issues, announcing candidacy or campaigning, or to engage in commercial speech attempting to sell a service or product to the board or to the public. Nor are they forums to address matters involving disciplinary actions of any kind, pending claims, complaints, or litigation against the district or district personnel. Also, public comment segments are not forums to engage in personal attacks against school system employees or board members. Statements regarding agenda items may be made by a member of the public shall be limited to three minutes duration. One designated group representative um, speaking on a proposition before the board will be allowed to have a maximum of six minutes. If a speaker goes over off topic from the specified agenda item, the presiding officer or a parliamentarian may interrupt the speaker to ensure the meeting continues in an orderly manner. Statements regarding non-agenda items made by a member of the public shall be limited to two minutes duration and shall occur after the board concludes its business agenda. No speaker may yield his or her time to other person, to any other person. Substitutions of speakers will not be allowed except in exceptional circumstances as determined by the presiding officer. Speakers shall direct their comments only to the board and may not address the audience or other speakers. Each speaker has a has completed the request to address the school board form as required by policy, shall introduce themselves, give the city of the residence, identify the matter to be addressed. Um, attendee, attendees must register their intention to participate in any public form portions of the meeting prior to the state of the public participation segment for the agenda items. Once the public participation segment for the meeting for the agenda items commences, no additional speaker forms for either public participation segments will be accepted by the board clerk. This policy does not prohibit the board from maintaining orderly conduct or proper decorum in a public meeting. Thank you. Okay, our first speaker is Nina Sandberg, followed by Sandra Stenoff. I'm Nina Sandberg, and I would like to address the school safety and security budget agenda item and the best practices assessment for our district. First of all, I think it's a no-brainer for SCPS to participate in the Guardians program. I'm, un I'm unable to even comprehend what your reasoning is for not participating in this program thus far. Also last year, SCPS had very severe safety and security problems in some of the middle schools, including Indian Trails Middle School and Markham Woods Middle School, just to name a couple of problem schools. Parents, teachers, and students became 100% fed up with the violence, fighting, bullying, drugs, and unwholesome atmospheres at some SCPS middle schools. There are, many diff very, there are many different factors which have contributed to this situation. Last week, I discovered that this board has failed to provide Indian Trails Middle School with the funding to hire an in-school suspension teacher for several years now. Our superintendent certainly should have suggested that the board fund an in-school suspension teacher for every single SCPS middle school as part of her safety and security recommendations. This is standard, proper middle school management. These schools have thousands of students in them, and you have not even bothered to provide in-school suspension classrooms for your middle schools. It is outrageous. I do not believe in using out-of-school suspensions except in extreme cases and for extreme offenses. The kids need to be in school and need to be participating academically. One of the basic management items that you must have in a middle school is an in-school suspension classroom. I volunteered to be a middle school in-school suspension teacher at one of the SEPS middle schools for full pay, of course, if you cannot find enough teachers for this task. However, it appears that you have not even provided the funding for these schools to post a help wanted posting for the in-school suspension teacher position. You have teachers quitting over your failure to handle discipline appropriately now. They are not just quitting over money, they are getting fed up with their working conditions. I was shocked to find out last week that you have not even bothered to fund in-school suspension teachers for our middle schools. This is outrageous, 
you must fix this immediately. Good evening. Thank you, board members and Superintendent Beeman. I am here to represent the Opt Out Florida Network, which advocates for meaningful assessment reform in support of high quality public education. I am addressing agenda item three, focus on student achievement for math progression and acceleration. I'm requesting six minutes. Try to talk fast. My daughter graduated from Lake Howell High School last year. When she entered Tuscaloosa Middle years ago, she was a strong student. However, near the end of seventh grade, her math teacher suggested that she would be better served in honors algebra one in eighth grade. She was a strong enough student that it did not occur to me that she could have been ill prepared to advance from regular math to honors algebra. In the eighth grade, she struggled from the very beginning, not because she wasn't capable, but because there is apparently a weeks long gap in content between regular and honors math. She said, a lot of this I've never seen, and that went on for weeks. Her counselor, teacher, and I considered moving her back to regular math, but none of us felt that was in her best interest. However, she never did catch up completely. I made her repeat the class as a high school freshman, and she was much better prepared for geometry and algebra two. There are two issues here. The first is time. Many math educators across the state have told me that given all of the time demands on teachers, there's simply too much math content to cover well in the high school math standards. Whether a student is proficient enough or not, the class is moving on. Some teachers feel it is too much to push onto middle school. Teachers need more time with students that is not just lecturing and assessing. Students may be able to work the mechanics of a problem, but their understanding of abstract math concepts is not really mature at the middle school level. But if there are students who are capable, they should be afforded that opportunity. So you may ask, but where can we squeeze more time out of a school day? I urge you once again to look at all the time SCPS dedicates to testing and preparing for testing, which robs teachers of time that could be used for genuine instruction, and not all of that is state mandated. Develop a teacher nominated committee for elementary, middle, and high school to look at all of the redundancy and assessments in the district. It is there, your teachers tell me so. Moving on, secondly, I'd like to address equity in math education. I know that Seminole and Orange County have worked with Dr. Paul Cottle at FSU to help improve access to high school physics instruction to better prepare more students for college physics, the gateway class to strong engineering pursuits. In order to, to, to support that effort, Orange County's calculus project helps prepare more students in middle school for higher level math with a summer boot camp. Specifically for students like my daughter was, students in regular streams but who are identified as capable of higher level math but who may lack sufficient background. Had she been provided access to early support such as that, I am confident she would not have had to spend another year. Seminole County has retained its standing as number one STEM district in the state. So while there may be districts trying to knock us off our perch, our competition is really just ourselves. If we are to surpass that test-based ranking and transform this district into the science powerhouse that we have the potential to be nationally, this must start by providing a more equitable access for all students, not just the students who show potential for higher level math performance, such as the students who are recommended for GEMS in elementary school. I want to share a thought on the Equity Advisory Committee, the vital work which has been attacked in this room by some parents and questioned by at least one school board member here. We would not dream of removing an IEP or a 504 from a student with special needs. We all can agree that these supports are needed to provide equitable access to a high quality education for children with special needs. Other supports, though not federally mandated, are equally as important for children who are marginalized, disenfranchised by poverty or ability, to help them to achieve equity. Equity is not a dirty word. It is only what is needed to be fair. Equity does not take away from others, but elevates us all. From lifelong educator and celebrated Volusia County English teacher, David Finkel, the idea is that giving every student exactly the same material is equitable. This idea is quite frankly wrong. Google equity versus equality, and you're told that equality means each individual or group of people is given the same resources or opportunities. 
Equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates the exact same resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. Making every child do the exact same work is equality. It is the sameness, as they call it in the book, The Giver. It is not equity. Equity means helping each student to a similarity of outcome using a variety of methods. Summer math camps are one such support that would do much to help more students who are capable to rise to the occasion and more importantly, to have more equitable access to higher level math and later on physics. It is not enough to provide high level classes. We must also provide the additional support so that more students who have the potential to achieve can also participate. Without a doubt, there are students flying below the radar right now who have the potential but not the access. These students will be future human capital lost to our community and our society. A simple summer math boot camp has the potential to change the entire trajectory of a child's life. Perhaps it is the child who will be the first in their family to go to college. Perhaps she will be the next NASA astronaut. I would like to say special thank you to Superintendent Beeman who took the time on Saturday to have a serious brief conversation with me about the potential of growing a real culture of science and excellence across the district. It was a beautiful expo at the Millennium Middle. Thank you. Jessica Tillman followed by Stephen Cornea. Good evening, my name is Jessica Tillman. I'm representing Moms for Liberty, Seminole County. Agenda item F is concerning. This seems like a new position at the district office with the capability to earn up to $120,000 a year. We have staff of all kinds from teachers to bus drivers coming complaining about pay and the superintendent seems more concerned with adding higher do high dollar positions at the district level than finding grants and funds to increase already existing staff pay. It also seems this position may, may be unnecessary as there are already staff at the schools who handle this. The way it is listed on the agenda seems like it is just a change in an existing job description, but I tried to find an existing position and it appears there isn't one. So it's not very transparent that this is a new position or an existing one. Item 10C had great suggestions on measures that are being taken to keep students and staff safe. I'm disappointed to see the Guardian program is not on this list. The Guardian program is in 46 out of 67 counties, but not here. St. John's, Orange, Osceola, Volusia, Brevard, Lake, Polk, Pasco, and Pinellas, to name a few, do have these, this program in, in place. All of these counties that are, are surrounding us have this program, and somehow Seminole County doesn't think it's necessary. It's also disappointing to hear middle schools do not have ISS teachers. It was mentioned last meeting there are more um, out of school suspensions in middle school than in high school. Why isn't the superintendent recommending ISS teachers for middle schools? Item 11C is approve, approval of the health education curriculum. Again, this curriculum speaks to reproductive health as does the state statute. So again, why did the board approve reproductive health being changed to human sexuality. It seems that this policy needs to be discussed and return the policy to teach reproductive health. Thank you. Madam Superintendent, board members, I rise to speak to agenda item G regarding the soliciting proposals to find health insurance uh, for the district, particularly in the area of mental health care. Uh, from the Florida Department of Education webpage, the mental health of Florida students and families is a top priority of the Florida Department Ed of Education. You will notice one category substantially missing from that, and that is teachers. According to a 21, 2021 study on the state of U.S. teachers by the RAND Corporation, 75% of teachers experience job-related stress compared to 40% of other working adults. Over the last three years, the burnout rate of teachers rose from 25% to 57%. 27% of teachers report depressed, suffering from depression as compared to only 10% of other adults. That's 275% more than other adults in the workforce. In a separate survey, nearly 80% of teachers reported that their mental health was worse compared to last year. Despite all this, despite these rampant problems with teachers suffering from mental health care, only 6% reported receiving counseling support 
and only 22% reported receiving emotional support for these issues. Looking at the current health care plan in Seminole County, uh, our EAP plan, which is supposed to provide access to counseling, provides only three visits. Three visits with a counselor per year. After that, students on the Seminole County uh, health care plan, the one provided at no cost to teachers, teachers are required to pay the negotiated rate, which can be upwards of $100 per visit until they reach their deductible of $1,750. After that, it is still a 20% copay. By contrast, in Orange County, which has the same health care provider that we do, the same manager, Cigna, teacher mental health care plan, their first five visits are no charge. Visits 6 through 10 are a $10 copay, and visits 11 through 20 are a $20 copay. By my quick math, that means a teacher in Orange County can visit a mental health professional 20 times for a total out-of-pocket cost of $260 as compared to over $1,700 here in Seminole County. Seminole County takes great pride in being an A-rated school district. The employees of Seminole County Public Schools deserve access to an A-rated system of mental health care. When soliciting a request for proposals for health care, please, I ask you, I beg you, to require any proposal submitted to have a mental health care plan similar to what Orange County provides. Your teachers in this A-rated school district deserve it. Thank you. Order, please. That concludes agenda public comment. Uh, Superintendent, do you have a recommendation for the consent agenda? Yes, that the consent agenda be approved as presented. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Uh, Superintendent, do you have a recommendation on student discipline hearings? Yes, that the school board of Seminole County approve the student disciplinary recommendations from October 10, 2022. A motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Superintendent, we have new business. Do you have a recommendation regarding curricula curriculum? Yes. The first item is that the School Board of Seminole County adopt the instructional materials, recommendations of the Social Studies Adoption Committee for K-5 Social Studies, and authorize the superintendent to purchase the highest-ranked committee choice that also appears on the 22-23 Florida DOE Social Studies Instructional Materials Adoption List current at the time of purchase. So moved. Second. All in favor, or <laughs> any further discussion? Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? A motion carries. We have a second recommendation. Yes, it's that the School Board of Seminole County authorize the African American History Instructional Materials Adoption Committee to expand review of course materials beyond the publishers identified on the 22-23 Florida DOE Social Studies Draft Short Bid Report. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I just want to provide clarification for anyone listening to this. This is authorization to just expand the search and look for materials and not make the purchase at this time Correct. to look. So um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And one more. One more. <laughs> that the school board of Seminole County accept the recommendation of the school safety specialist and authorizes the required submission of the information required by Florida Statute 1006.07, subsection 6, to the Office of Safe Schools. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I'll I think someone wants to discuss oh, it though, yes. before we vote. I apologize. We have to have I, a presentation. Thank we you. We do. <laughs> Captain Fordenberry, apologize for not, al not allowing you to, to make the, the report uh, before the recommendation. My apologies. It's all yours. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. You can. Good evening, board members, Madam Chair and Superintendent. <clears throat> Today, crime creates fear that reaches every corner of our society, including our schools. No greater challenge exists today than creating a safe school or restoring schools to tranquil and safe places of learning. The challenge requires a significant strategic commitment and involves placing school safety at the top of the educational agenda. School safety is, a, is vital because children, teachers, administrators, 
and parents can concentrate on developing and maintaining an optimal learning environment when everyone feels safe. Seminole County Sheriff's Office has been responsible for school safety for uh, the Seminole County Public Schools for the past seven years. Being responsible for Seminole County's most vulnerable is a tremendous honor and a responsibility we take very seriously. We have been incredibly blessed to have unwavering support from the School Board of Seminole County, the Superintendent, school executives, SCPS staff, the sheriff, and other key stakeholders. The Office of School Safety will continue our mission to safeguard the safety and security of these students, staff, faculty, and property. We will also continue to ensure a highly trained and qualified workforce of school resource deputies and officers. Our schools should not resemble fortresses. We cannot barricade against all possible harm, and to try to do so is counterproductive to maintaining a healthy learning environment. Except excessive building security does not promote a sense of safety or student well-being, nor does it provide a guarantee of protection against an armed intruder. Reasonable physical security, such as locked doors, access control, and visitor check-in system must be combined with efforts to promote a favorable school climate. This includes trust among staff, students, families, where students feel connected and part of a close-knit and caring community in which they feel empowered to report any safety concerns. School community partnerships create a safe environment inside schools by creating a safe environment outside of schools. Law enforcement and community initiatives extend student safety beyond the confines of the schoolyard, effectively reducing the severity and prevalence of violence in schools. We should continuously examine whether our efforts are striving to make people safer feel safer or making schools safer. It's a balancing act to create a safe school and preserve the learning environment. School safety discussions require a proactive approach to solve issues, meaningful conversations with stakeholders, data analysis, research, a review of best practices and lessons learned. Continued review related to the frequency of active threat drills is still needed. While these drills and training for emergency situations is imperative, Quality is more important than quantity. As students get older, less drills should be necessary, but the conversation should continue to happen discussing different scenarios. This is a concern with a number of required drills that students may experience drill fatigue and that ultimately they will not be taken seriously. It is, I, is my recommendation that the School Board of Seminole County continue our school hardening plan with emphasis placed on the fencing, cameras, single point entries and access control. Uh, funding however, funding continues to be a challenge, but uh, we are working towards additional grants. Okay, thank you, Captain Thornberry. Um, it is my recommendation that the School Board of Seminole County accepts the recommendation of the School Safety Specialist and authorizes the required submission of the information required by Florida Statute Section 1006.07, subsection 6, to the Office of Safe Schools. So we already have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion or questions? Okay. I, I just want to thank Captain on behalf of, I think all of us to share our thanks to the sheriff directly for the collaboration and cooperation and having those licensed SROs or SRDs. It's quite a financial commitment, but I know from having many conversations with the sheriff, that's the direction that the professionals in law enforcement are suggesting and we're blessed to be able to do that. Yeah, I wanted to say the same thing and the fact that the state is looking to adopt everything that we're doing here. No, I know we're not perfect and there's kinks, but we are definitely way ahead of the game in so many ways. And um, it's to all of our fabulous, fabulous faculty as well as our SROs, police officers, captain, Sheriff and everybody that um, so diligently work together to make sure that we're safe. Thank you. We thank you. Captain Fortenberry. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Superintendent, do you have a report? I do. I have a number of things I want to update the board about, and I will ask Mr. Wolski to make his way to the podium um, to give an, an update on Evans Elementary. But while, I'm, while he's moving, I, I do want to thank the board for approving the job description that is an ESSER funded through 2024 that would allow for the, the management 
of the ESSER plan for summer and after school activities that includes some of the camps that have been discussed here tonight. So I, I do thank you for that. Um, and it is not a new position that is coming from the general fund. It is coming from the, the funds in your plan that you approved. Mr. Wolski. Good evening, Chair Tenick, Board Member, Superintendent um, Beeman. Just like to give a little up, uh, timeline and update where we are with the Evans um, Concretables. So mid-August 22 this school year, uh, we received, started receiving several concerns regarding HVAC temperatures um, and the concretable classrooms, which are the classrooms outside the main building. We had ordered new HVAC units in, um, in March of 2022. Um, so we've had a, a supply chain delay on those. As we headed into September, we still had temperature concerns. Uh, we're still being shared uh, by some of our teachers. So portable AC units and dehumidifiers were installed. Towards the latter part of September, several teachers questioned the air quality in these classrooms because staff were sharing concerns and you know, safety is of our highest concern. Uh, the decision was made by the principal to temporarily move the classes inside the main building until additional assessments um, could be performed. September 26, um, our uh, facility services team, uh, we engaged with uh, Gallagher Bassett Consulting Firm to determine the next steps and to, to conduct an assessment of the classrooms. On October 12th, our facility services team and I, uh, we met with our, uh, our teachers whose classrooms had been um, in the concretables. We had originally planned to meet uh, September 28th, but we had to reschedule based on Hurricane Ann, so that's why the delay um, on that. The weekend of October 15th and 16th, um, new HVAC units were installed in the concretable classrooms. Uh, the vendor was able to provide us a partial delivery um, on those units, so we got a little bit earlier than they ex expected. The week of October 18th, um, we had an independent environmental consultant was on site conducting assessments of the classroom. So kind of where we're at now. So the independent environment consultant is working on completing those assessments, coming up with a, uh, a final report. Uh, he will develop a scope of work for whatever items may require attention. Um, whatever work that may be necessary uh, to be done will be conducted by a certified environmental contractor and overseen by the independent environmental consultant. All the work will be completed in compliance with the Florida Nationwide Industry Standards, EPA and OSHA. And then all work will be finalized prior to any staff or students being allowed to return to our concretable classrooms. So right now we're just waiting on that final report so we can start working getting our students back in classrooms. Do we have an ETA of when the report will be delivered? We're hoping very soon. So if it's not towards the uh, end of this week, um, early next week. Any other, go ahead. Um, are we able to get a preliminary report before the final report or is that something that they wait until the end? They wait till the end because what they're gonna do is they put the report together and what was shared with me with our team was that then they will also have that reviewed before it's finalized and shared with us. Makes sense, thank you so much. Like a much. peer review. Peer Appreciate review. it. Any other questions? Go ahead. Does there come a time when the expense to remediate and repair override the value of the unit? Or how? when do we, I know we're waiting for all of the data and information, but well, at I'm what sure, point? Well, the key is the, the independent consultant is going to provide that scope of work um, of what needs to be done in a sense of what needs to be placed, repaired, or well, you know, we go from there. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Wolski. Okay. Um, would like to say thank you to the, the foundation um, for providing um, financial support for the disaster relief for um, employees, and also Ms. Elwood and her team. Um, we had our first event where Seminole County Public Schools employees were able to come in to 
talked through a number of different things, provide some, they were provided some resources, um, provided some financial um, resources, um, but also information. It was, it was wildly successful, I think, in the way that our social workers, um, led by our FEN team, was, they were able to provide the comprehensive needs assessments based on the individual employee's needs. And so we, I think we saw 61 um, employees on that day, and we have another event that's scheduled for this Thursday. We already have about 50 staff members that have been um, signed up pre-registered, but we will continue to take those registrations um, even on the day of. So I just wanted to say thank you to the foundation for um, providing some of that financial support, and thank you to Ms. Elwood's team for making sure that we have those conversations with our employees to see how best we can assist. And then finally, I, there's a number of other things in my um, report that are read only, but I became aware of something today that uh, did not make it into the read only that I, I wanted to um, tell you about. It's, we're gonna end on a happy. Yes. As you know, back in 2016, the school board approved the application of the XQ um, Institute for what became Sci High and we've received a number of uh, financial awards through the foundation from, Sci from XQ over the years, um, 2.5 back in 2019, that took us through the end of last school year. And so we've been talking a lot about sustaining um, the program, and today we were notified, well, I was notified that we're getting an additional $100,000 to help our That's efforts in making sure that we sustain our Sci High program. So I thought I'd Yay. end on a happy on something that just um, came in. Thank you. Okay, board committee update, Member Allman. I, we can't hear you. Right. That's okay. Represented the Foundation for Seminole County Public Schools and had an opportunity to present workplace giving at Casper Elementary. And um, it was a very rewarding experience. And it's great that we have the foundation to support our teachers and our students along with what we do here as a district. Uh, the ESOL Youth Summit was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jose Enriquez, the founder of Latinos in Action, and then the keynote speaker, Franklin Castellanos, was an inspiration um, beyond words. Young man that, that had some tragedy in his life and doesn't let it stop him. He makes it his mission to make sure that others appreciate every single day and having their hands and feet to work with. So kudos to Minnie Cardona for bringing that to us. And then I'll leave some things for other people. Um, Casbury Chamber has their food and wine fest coming up at Lake Concord Park, November the 14th from six to nine. Um, they raise funds for student scholarships and also to support the arts within the city of Casbury. And they also support Casbury Elementary and English Estate. <coughs> so it's a, a great event, great community event. Thank you, that's my report. Member Calderon. Um, we've continued our school visits, which have been phenomenal to be able to observe those ramp classes. But um, also, um, Missa Mills has been out working with dividend training in many of our schools, and she's also celebrating the anniversaries of so many of our volunteers at Pinecrest the other day with the RSVP program, seeing the grandmas there, and they just loved getting their awards, and they wouldn't want to be anywhere else other than that helping hand. So thank you to all of our volunteers and thank you for Missa for leading the way. And she was also at a leadership seminal this afternoon event, reminding people about the giving tree. Uh, we do have more students in need this year and we want to make sure the holidays are special to them. So um, I'm sure we'll be posting through social media, but there'll be a QR code that you can go right online, order through your own Amazon account, and have it delivered right here to the offices. Alternatively, if you'd like to purchase on your own or drop off gift cards, we're accepting all of those donations until December 5th. So keep that in the back of your mind if you'd like to support our special students. And I'd like to publicly thank Abby Sanchez for wearing the Seminole <laughs> High School football jer jersey. It has become oh, yes. a tradition <laughs> that I will bet 
whoever. Last year it was Mrs. Pennock who got <laughs> to don that beautiful shirt. Um, it was Seminole High versus Lake Mary High, but this year for homecoming it was Seminole High and Lake Brantley. And who won that game, Ms. Sanchez? Not telling you. Poor Lake Brantley has their homecoming game this weekend. Really, and I have to wear this. But <laughs> this is very few. This is not heard from my mouth very often, but oh, go Knowles. <laughs> <laughs> Seminole High Knowles, that is. <laughs> um, the Orlando Science Center had their board retreat uh, this past Saturday. I got to spend the day with some phenomenal business leaders that are supportive of STEM within our schools, and I urge the school district to continue all the positive relationships we have that, with that entity. Thank you to our students and teachers who displayed artwork at the Winter Springs Art Festival this past weekend. And I wanna publicly again thank WOW, the internet um, company that will be coming into Seminole County in the very near future. They donated $45,000 to Goldsboro <laughs> Elementary. Ms. Krause was able to be there and we met all the senior leadership team and even from their um, companies that work with them in Washington, D.C. came down and they were very impressed with what our teachers and students are doing and are also represented on our CRIM's uh, business advisory board. So they're really embracing our community um, and I'm so thrilled to welcome them into the organization. Our Teacher of the Year lunches have been great and just as we've heard through our work session and also tonight, it's so very important for us to listen to the input from our students, listen to the input from our teachers, and I'm glad to say there were some phenomenal ideas that were shared and <coughs> we're hope to implement as fast as possible. Um, we celebrated, I know most of us attended Lake Mary High School, the one year anniversary of the donations through the Bernsteins and Allie's Hope, and the students are just so very excited to lead and to work with their students to make sure it's a better place and everybody has a safe room to go to and people to listen to. And I wanna thank all the social workers that are involved and everyone that collaborates for that important thing. Um, I'll just do one more. I know there's so many others, but um, the PTA principal breakfast was great to again meet face to face and see the energy in the room. And thank you to all our PTA members and leaders that support our schools. Um, it truly does take everyone in this community working together, so thank you. And I'll end on that. Yes. Um, first, I'd like to say that the zoo will be officially opening tomorrow. Uh, so finally, uh, the doors will open, our animals are safe. We still have a lot of cleaning up to do. However, we are making progress. As we wait for the zoo to open up, and tomorrow we still have the Zoo Boo Bash and the Asian Lantern Festival. You can hold that up with Dr. Calderon again. <laughs> that is coming up, and believe it or not, we are selling out. So you need to go on to the Sanford Zoo site and purchase your tickets as soon as possible for that. The Zoo Boo, Hoo Bash, Boo Bash will be this weekend, and it's a great way for your children or anybody else's children to see the animals and also trick-or-treat at the same time. Also, Wakaiva Island has offered their s location on Friday evening from 4 until 11 p.m. to help raise funds for the zoo uh, until we get FEMA money to come in uh, since we've been closed for about three weeks now. Uh, the wellness, I'd like to thank the wellness committee, Amy Smith and Kate and you know Don Bonson, and everybody that helped organize our fabulous top golf event for the Sanchez squatters <laughs> who won last year. The award, we had a great time. Teague was not able to be there. That was the only school because we had to set it up to, uh, for a different date due to the hurricane. But I know Dr. I, mean, I know that Sarita and I had a great time. Uh, and I, you can see every single person in there, they let off steam. They had so much fun. It was so relaxing. And I hope we can do more and more of those events. It really was well needed. And um, we had a blast. So thank you for putting that together. Homecoming events, as we know, are going really well. Uh, please, if you're listening, talk to your children about being smart, making good choices, um, thinking before they decide to do something that may they may regret. That's all. I'm going to leave it at that. Also, I'd like to thank Dr. Williams for helping with the, and also organizing the D.D. Schaffner Marching Band Festival. We had a fabulous time at that. Uh, all of us pretty much were there for that, and it was once again phenomenal, but to also watch those 
parents in action as well as the students and to see how well they work together and how they just can agree to disagree, but they all get along and they just do an amazing job. It's such, they're such great role models. Running for Heroes also was this past, a uh, couple weekends ago, 501C that um, honors our military, not military, actually police officers are fallen heroes that have died in the line of duty. And uh, one of our students, Zachariah, um, and Cartledge is the one that started that many years, my gosh, three or four years ago now. And he is still doing a great job with it. And um, we now have a facility there that anybody can go and look and check out. It's really neat to go and see. And then the last thing I wanted to say was um, thank uh, Minnie Cardona and our ESOL department and Latinos in Action. Boy, we had a great time dancing at the farmer's market. <laughs> Uh, Sarita has some great moves as well, <laughs> and uh, we we really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun, and I know a lot of us have been going to different events. I couldn't make the like Brantley one, but I know you guys were there, so I appreciate you all being there for that. And um, other than that, have a great evening. Member Crow, thank you. Um, there are a couple things left. Uh, the Children's Cabinet, of which I'm a part, they are going to combine with Community Alliance, which we talked about. I think that'll be a good um, partnership. Uh, their guest speaker last month um, did a presentation from Pri Primary Care Access Network, and I'll forward you all the email. Um, they help you locate low-cost insurance and health care for, for um, those it's a 501c3 as well. Um, I attended the ribbon cutting for Lotus Behavioral Health, which is a residential treatment center for youth um, 12, ages 12 to 17 for addiction and recovery. Um, they have a fabulous um, home away from home. Uh, most of the residents stay for 45 days and I was able to represent us there. We visited Lawton Elementary with the superintendent and Mr. Senko, and you were talking about the map on and off ramps. Well, I had to go off the ramp to get Mr. Senko to help a student with the problem because I didn't know I didn't know how to answer it or how to how, how to help her. But that was an interesting visit. Um, we also did the um, the Lake Brantley Latinos in Action during their lunch break. That was fabulous. All the student groups were um, present and participating, and they had a lot of fun. And then the um, Student Transition Achievement Center rib ribbon cutting. I hope there's something left for you, Amy, to talk, to talk about. That was a fabulous renovation, um, classroom setting, and so happy that we have that for our students, our JET students. Thank you. Dr. Calderon, you had one more thing you wanted to add. I forgot to give a shout out. I thought someone else was in attendance at this event, and I realized I perhaps was the only board member there. Um, our community leadership training that we get offer to our community each month this month, I just wanted to give a shout out to Sean Gard Harold, did a great job on ePathways. We met at Seminole High School and the community members got to tour either the Health Academy or the Aviation Magnets and then we came back and described all of our programs of emphasis and magnets and it's just so exciting the different pathways. We talk about math on and off ramps, but we offer so much more than that. So we truly are finding, allowing the students to find their E. And it, it's great when you can see it come to life. So I just want to thank the community members who joined the Leadership Academy, but most importantly, our staff who go above and beyond to provide that learning experience so we can all better support our students and staff. Thanks. Member Allman. So I'm going to use, thank you, I'm going to use the same excuse as Dr. Calderon. I thought someone would say this. The Choice is Expo at Millennium yeah. this past Saturday. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you couldn't move. In fact, I described it as a mosh pit. It was great <laughs> to see the community engaged. So many families, so many um, young kids that were interested in their future and the choices that they could make. So thank you to everyone that participated, all the principals were out lot of parents and teachers and thank you um, a few things the I'm gonna piggyback on what you said member Allman um, the Latinos in Action Youth Summit was amazing 
um, the young gentleman that spoke um, had con or some, he got a bacterial yeah, infection right. and lost all of his limbs. But um, his message, along with the other speaker who's the founder of Latinos in Action, was really about um, how the, the journey is really the biggest part um, of, of, the, of everything. Um, it's, the, it's the best part of what you do to get to the destination. And he said, sometimes I would get to the destination and I would just be like, oh, and more fun in the journey. And so listening to the math talk today and productive struggle, um, the, what we're giving these kids is those lessons in the journey so that when they get to the destination, maybe it's not such a letdown, but um, we're giving them the tools. And that, I, I, that just really struck out to me how, um, those two messages kind of came together. Um, the kids in that room, I walked around from table to table, what do, you, what do you enjoy about this program? And they all said, it's the community, it's the relationships, it's the family, it's the voice, it's my voice, it gives me a voice. And I think that that, that is just wonderful to hear that our students who come in and may not speak a full other, our language, English. Some of them struggled when they got up and talked, but saw people from all different countries that spoke the same language, that had the same kind of background, and they became an instant family. And that, that is what I think is the epitome of Seminole County Public Schools. Um, Tina and I did the Lake Mary um, homecoming parade. You also did the Seminole um, that evening. And it's, I, I just have to say how awesome it is to see the spirit back in the schools, the being able to do stuff um, full on without restrictions. Um, the spirit just is wonderful. The kids love it. The pep rallies are awesome to watch and see and so, so awesome. Um, I did take a, a trip out to Evans Elementary last Friday because I wanted to show support of the staff. Um, and while you know, it is a struggle to move kids in viewpoint classrooms. Um, we saw a lot of good things happening. The kids were, were learning. Um, you know, it's hard as adults when we know what needs to happen, but we have to be flexible. And I, we just saw it in the kids. A lot of one-on-one -on -one learning. They're, they were happy. Yes, some were stressed out, but I, I think that's, you know, happens all the time, but, um, you know, went out, out on our behalf and just <coughs> sat and listened and, and kind of walked the classrooms. Um, I, you guys have taken a lot of the stuff, but I will just say um, I was asked to speak at a, a national engineering conference on all the good things that we're doing STEM related as it, as it in regards to women, female, what we're doing with all our female students, the physics classes and stuff. And so thank you, Sean Gard Harold, for creating a presentation that I'll be able to deliver to this group half of SCTS. So I'm very excited for that. That is all of board committee updates. We are on to public comment non-agenda items. Uh, first speaker is Ann O'Donnell, followed by Deborah Donahue, followed by Nina Sandberg. Good evening. My name is Ann O'Donnell of, o of Oviedo. I'm here to recognize October as Dyslexia Awareness Month. However, it is a daily affair for our family and, and for one in five individuals. I'm the proud mom of two dyslexic daughters, received 60 hours of Orton Gillingham training, and earned a dyslexic certificate through the University of Florida. Dyslexia is the most common learning disability and identified as individuals struggling with word recognition, decoding, and spelling. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component that is often unexpected compared to their intellectual abilities. Many teachers often comment that students can orally explain a concept, yet unable to write about what they just learned. They often read slower and below grade level. They simply need a new way to learn to help their processing. I've been asked what the difference is between what schools have been doing and what parents of dyslexic students have been wanting for their children. 
I earned my elementary education degree almost 30 years ago, and it was only until a few years ago that I realized I didn't know how to teach students to read. The difference is that dyslexics struggling and all readers need to learn through an explicit, systematic, and multisensory approach. While we often teach students that there are 26 letters, do we teach them that there are 44 phonemes in the English language? We no longer teach students to guess at words, look at pictures, but to teach them this, the skills truly to the code. Are we teaching students that some rules don't follow the, don't follow the rules and are regular? I can't ask a student to sound out a word like said and put. They don't follow the rules. Many students years ago never knew about the word pandemic. However, the science of reading could have taught them that it is from the Greek language ik, meaning relating to, dem meaning people, pan, pan, and pandemic simply means relating to all people. I ask that the board start looking into ways to teach science of reading to all students. Thank you. Thank you. If you have additional information you want to share, Jill can take it and send it out to the rest of us. Good evening, board members. Good evening, superintendent. You're at a critical crossroad for teacher retention and recruitment in this district. I've, lost, or I've listened to the last several meetings and I've heard teachers beg you for better working conditions for themselves and learning conditions for their students. Doesn't appear to have happened yet. I've listened to teachers, speech pathologists beg you for more money. It hasn't happened yet. One of the factors of teachers who cite lower levels of morale is that they feel a lack of respect by their own school board. Studies show that when teachers are stressed, they also report lower levels of morale. Lower levels of morale mean teachers are more likely to leave. In schools with unsupportive working conditions, teachers' perception of their own success falls from 90% to 48%. That's from Kraft and Simon, a study that was published in 2020. It's time for you to do the right thing your teachers deserve respect, significant raises, better working conditions for teachers, and better learning conditions for students. Thank you. Order, please. I'm Nina Sandberg, and I represent the peasants that you have told to go eat cake like you are Marie Antoinette. You need to restore non-agenda public comment time to three minutes immediately. You need to vote to do this tonight as you had no business taking non-agenda public comment time away from the citizens who you work for. They pay your salary and they voted you into office. You have betrayed their trust and you have given them your middle finger. Employees, parents, and students do not review your hundreds of pages of agenda packets to pick something to talk about when they come to the public board meetings. They come to the meetings because they have a school-related problem that you need to fix that is not necessarily in your agenda packet. They need at least three minutes and 380 lousy words to explain the problem to you. It is your job to listen to them and then to attempt to fix the problem. You are now so selfish, self-centered, and arrogant that you cannot give them three lousy minutes of your time to listen to their problems even though they are paying you to do so. You know this is wrong. Why haven't you fixed this yet? Supposedly, at least three board members support making non-agenda public comment time three minutes again. So why are the citizens still getting only two minutes when you don't even support the policy that you supposedly voted for? I don't know why you voted for it, but you need to unvote for it and fix this tonight. Also, the situation at Evans Elementary School is an emergency situation, and it needs to be treated like an actual emergency. Order, please. Isa Jaffer, followed by David White, followed by Raquel Molina. Good afternoon, members of this respective school board. My name is Faiza Jaffer, and I'm a senior at Lake Mary High School. First, I would like to extend my gratitude to all members of the school board for taking time to listen and consider changes to current Seminole County policies. Today, I'm here to advocate for students who are survivors of sexual assault and or harassment in Seminole County School District. 
What is sexual harassment? The legal definition of sexual harassment states that it is an unwelcome sexual advance, unwelcome request for sexual favors, or other unwelcome con conduct of a sexual nature which make a person feel offended, humiliated, and or intimidated, where a reasonable person would anticipate that reaction in the circumstance. This is an e epidemic that is deemed as normal or rather desensitized in Seminole County schools. A survey conducted in Atta High School in Connecticut found that 78% of students reported experiencing at least one incident of sexual harassment since starting high school. This isn't just an isolated statistic. This is a testament to the prevalence of sexual harassment and or assault. Each person behind these numbers may be your daughter, your niece, or your sister. But even if you don't know a survivor of sexual harassment, we all have an imperative to act. A 12-year-old student who has been sexually harassed may not even be aware that what they have experienced is a tantamount to sexual harassment. For those who do know that they have been sexually harassed, they typically do not know what Title IX is. Most students don't know who their Title IX coordinator is and may be afraid to come forward to their coordinator, even if it is the very same principal they see every day at school. This district has inadequate Title IX accessibility to students, and this needs to change. It is not about fulfilling a legal requirement, but also about ensuring that student survivors are supported. Thank you. Order, please. Hello. My son Hayden White was born premature. During the June 2022 board meeting, I expressed my concerns with Seminole County about the way they handle students with special needs, especially those that have complicated medical histories. Today I come to you with an update, in my opinion, you as well as members of the public need to be aware of. Seminole County remains steadfast in their ways that their curriculum is more, imp excuse me, is more important than my son's medical needs. After receiving documentation from pediatric physicians, medical data from specialists, including neurologists, neurosurgeons, physical and occupational therapists, among many others, a request for Hayden to attend half days remains denied. In a, me in a meeting held just today at Wicklow at 2.30, the team decided that Hayden should not receive accommodations of half days from schools denying him the time for medical therapies and intervention since the school is taking up the time needed for these services. Anyone that signals that my son's medical needs are not as important as the educational needs of the district shouldn't be caring for children. Hayden's medical therapies are needed to assist him with many conditions, including cerebral palsy. Without these critical services, Hayden will regress and lose all of the progress we have fought for since birth on giving him a chance to interact with society like any other child. I spoke with the Department of Health in Seminole health officer Mrs. Walsh this afternoon who advised she would seek to get assistance from her department and to see if they can find a reason why Seminole County made their decision to keep Hayden full-time denying him of his medical therapies. This goes to show that even though Seminole County is a resource, the health department is a resource to Seminole County schools, they did not use it when it came to caring for my child even though they rely on that same department for medical advice. In summary, it appears that Seminole County is now in the business of making medical decisions, or should I say ignoring medical advice and decisions from trained physicians. I'll do everything in my power as an advocate for my child to raise awareness, to include taking advantage of every public forum available to me, including the media. Thank you. Order, please. Good afternoon. My name is Raquel Molina and I have I've been in Seminole County for over 20 years and my daughter Emily has been in Seminole County Public School since the age of three and she aged out of high school um, a few months back. I believe it was March of this year, yeah. Um, I'm here because I'm begging for the non, I have to put my glasses on, um, the non-agenda public comment to change back to three minutes instead of two minutes. For someone that suffers from really bad anxiety disorder, I need possibly six minutes to speak instead of just two minutes. 
why, my question to you all is, why was it changed from, two, from three minutes to two minutes? I know you can't answer, maybe you can um, send me a response via, via email. I really don't understand why now the, um, the agenda, the non-agenda public comments, agenda public comments, it's in between the meeting and then the non-agenda public comments, it's at the end of the school board meeting. I really don't understand. So hopefully I can get your response via email because it just doesn't make sense why it's been separated, why non-agenda items is two minutes now and then agenda items is three minutes. For someone with a disability or anxiety disorder like I, this is very difficult for me to come over here and share. And I've shared a lot of issues with you because I'm not gonna get into detail because board members also very, board member and superintendent is very familiar with what I went through with my special needs daughter in the ESD department. And I really want response. I never got response to the issues that my child went through. Hopefully I can get the response in regards to, to why it was changed for three minutes to two minutes for the non-agenda public comments. I really want some response, please. Thank you. Order, please. Our pool, followed by Julia Rodolsky, followed by Valerie Palmer. Uh, good evening, my name is Hannah Poole. Um, I am a teacher at Goldsboro Elementary. Um, I'm in my seventh year of service, and I also am a graduate of Seminole High School. I attended Millennium and Pinecrest in the late 90s, um, so I've been in the county my whole life. My husband is also a teacher here. He teaches physics at Lyman. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Seminole is a special place, um, and because of this community, for the last 15 years, we've seen public education defunded and our credentials attacked, and your teachers have stayed. Um, during the pandemic, when we were asked to do two jobs at once and teach the kids at home and in person, your teachers stayed. When the governor said, you have to go back face to face, no matter your health status, your teachers stayed. Um, and as we were asked to do more, test more, sign more paperwork, do more PDs, carry more burden of discipline, reach out to more parents as we lose paras and coaches and aides, teaching kids content, but also basic social skills, calming strategies, and not to mention how to evade a school shooter, <laughs> the teachers are staying, we've stayed. Uh, with the new laws in Florida limiting us with inflation at 8.5%, with childcare and housing costs at an all-time high, um, and the constant expectation of us to operate like machines, uh, teachers are beginning to feel that the grass might be greener elsewhere. Nationwide, 40% of new teachers quit within the first five years. In this school district alone, 108 teachers have left postings since August. It's only October. And as of this morning, there are 16 instructional postings that have not been filled, and half of them are reposting. So teachers in the audience, stand. Please stand. Woo! Order, please. Please direct your comment to the board, not the audience. Thank you. Um, the teachers behind me, please stand if you have considered leaving the position in the last five years. Please stand if you have considered leaving. Thank you. All right. So um, to my colleagues, I cannot apparently address you, but stop working overtime. Stop doing all the extra stuff you're doing. Are, and to are the members of the board, there? I know that your jobs are not simple. I know that you have to think of all your stakeholders. I understand that. Um, but if investing in your dedicated workforce isn't in the best interest of your stakeholders, then what is? Um, Ms. Poole, I implore are you, almost you to work with your bargaining team to consider the SEA proposal and find ways to close the gap uh, without requiring us to go to impasse because not only will that be a PR disaster for you and the county, which I don't want either, um, you are going to lose your most valuable stakeholders. Thank you. Order, please. Next speaker.
Good evening, members of the school board. Uh, my name is Julia Radulski, and I'm a fourth grade educator that has been working in the district since I graduated college in 2020. I can't emphasize enough how thrilled I was when I was hired by the premier district of Central Florida. I was not deterred from the 40 minute drive from Orange County. I wanted to work at SCPS. In my first year of teaching, I constantly heard how teachers were the heroes of COVID. I didn't mind staying out of contract time. I would stay and I would translate documents into Spanish for parents who didn't speak English. I would grade papers, I would lesson plan, and I would do the ever growing list of what teachers are responsible for. When first year teacher salary was raised to a living wage, I was ecstatic. I could finally afford to pay for my master's degree. However, while simultaneously completing my master's and teaching, it became a lot harder to feel excited about a job where there is no upward mobility. Right now, I only have to worry about myself. I don't understand how on the same wage I am expected to survive if my circumstances change and I decide I want to start a family. It is hard to feel valued in a district where seniority isn't celebrated or compensated. There is no reason for me to stay in this procession, profession besides the students and the relationships I have built with them. Sadly, these relationships will not sustain me for the 40 years I have left until retirement. SCPS needs to pay teachers a fair wage. If not, they will use veteran teachers alike and new teachers just like me. Thank you for your time. Order, please. Order. Thank you. Good evening, school board members and Superintendent Beeman. My name is Valerie Palmer. In my 25 years as an educator, I have never stood in front of a school board and begged to be paid the wages that I am worth. When I moved back to my home state of Florida about eight years ago, it was because I wanted to have a chance to impact the youth of the state that I was educated in like I had done for many years in Georgia. I left the Metro Atlanta area with the understanding that I would take a pay cut. However, what I was not aware of at the time is that I would not be compensated for the masters in curriculum or the specialist in ed leadership that I had worked so hard to obtain. The state of Florida had determined that because I had obtained a bachelor's degree in early childhood education, that somehow a master's degree in curriculum does not relate to the educating of children. I was, and still am, befuddled by this decision. So what began as a $10,000 pay cut ultimately turned into a $38,000 pay cut. If I base this number on what I would still be making had I chosen to continue my career in Georgia just one state north of us. There is no rate reason that an A-rated school district, one that boasts about being prestigious, chooses not to pay the very people who make it the premier district that it is. In closing, my time is valuable. We should be adequately compensated for this. However, if we agree that the board is only interested in compensating us for the seven hour workday, then I will only provide seven hours worth of work, which means that the extra three Order. hours I stay each week away from my own family to prepare newsletters, grade papers, and get myself ready for the next day will no longer get done. That way, no one feels that they are being taken advantage of. Thank you for your time. Sure, please. Allow the chairman speak. Philip Yost, followed by Steve Ratcliffe, followed by Jessica Cregan. My name is Phil Yost. I am from Longwood. Seminole County Board members, Superintendent, good evening. Growing up, I was told that actions speak louder than words. Over the course of 25 years, I have shown my passion for students and children across Central Florida by being a teacher and a children's pastor. I've arrived early, sometimes before the custodians even arrive, and I have stayed till 9 o'clock p.m. with my math curriculum spread out across my desk. It's because my actions speak louder than the words that I teach my kids. 
I'm a single dad. I have a master's degree. I've had to receive financial assistance from friends and from my church. I currently have two part-time jobs, and I may have to find a third part-time job just to make sure I have uh, just enough at the end of the month. You say that you care about your students and your teachers, but actions don't seem to show that. If you do care, show us teachers by increasing our salary. If you value our best effort, which is what's best for our students, I ask you to show it. Or if our superintendent can get a 3% raise with only about a year of service, what about the teachers that have dedicated their time, energy, and additional time outside of regular school hours for many years to get all the work done to be considered worthy and honorable to receive an increase? I'm asking that you pay us for all the hours we put in. I'm asking you honor our hard work and have your actions match your words. For if we're all in this together, actions need to take place to keep teachers in the classroom. Thank you. Order, please. My name is Stephen Radcliffe, 751 East Chapman Road. My children spent one year each in the portables at Evans Elementary. I was shocked to learn the teachers have been complaining about multiple issues in the portables for over 10 years. I like the questions y'all asked of the gentleman about time frames and cost to remediate and reconstruction. I think that's super critical to follow up on and stay on. Um, I also don't understand the question, uh, the air conditioning issue. They're getting new air conditioners in. I argued about putting air conditioners in and they still put them in very quickly for some reason knowing they're fixing to do mold assessments. Does not make sense to put in new air conditioners before mold assessments. In the folders that I've provided you, I provide the board members, the school board attorney, the superintendent, and the secretary. The first picture shows the exterior wall of the portable. You can, as you can see in this picture, you can see on the left side where the paint and mold is growing. That's from water repeatedly hitting the wall over and over again. And that is confirmed by the teachers saying they've actually got video of water rushing into the portables. We're talking about um, flooring and subflooring. We don't even know what the materials are made out of. Now, what is the condition of those materials? The next picture is a picture of an exterior window frame. This is just pictures that I took quickly. That is repeated over and over, caulking to the frame, to the windows, constant problems. All they did is they replaced the windows, they just caulked and caulked and caulked. The next picture, underneath an air conditioning unit. You can see the mold and mildew there, the water, the condensate was dripping down and actually running underneath the portables, and making it even worse for the portables. If you reach your hand under any of these portables right now, it's soaking wet. The water stays under the portables. The next picture is a sewer drain coming from a pipe inside the portable carrying toilet water or sink water. You can see from this, the ground is up against the portable. All these portables are sitting on the ground. They shouldn't be on the ground at all. The sewer drain is compromised. You can see the moisture barrier around it and the seal around it. So you can have snakes going up there, squirrels, whatever they want to go up there and into the bathrooms of these kids. The next picture, I'm not a mold expert, but this is a picture I took of what I believe if you look online, those are mold spores fixed into exit the paint, painted surface of the drywall. The next picture, window frame of the interior part of a window. Next picture, underneath the window frame. Of it. This is years of abuse, years of neglect, and you also multiple repairs. This isn't just one time. You can see drywall being repaired over and over again. And the last two pictures, the interior part of the drywall under the window frame of one of the windows. That drywall is supposed to be white. That's mold underneath those windows. It's my opinion that I think that every emergency measure right now allowed under the Florida Administrative Code and the laws of Florida should be instituted immediately. We have big problems here, and they're not being really addressed. Thanks. Order, please. Good evening. My name is Jessica Krieg, and I have a second grader at Evans Elementary School. This is our first year in the concretables. I'm floored that we are first now getting some type of transparency, but it is absolutely lacking. We as parents deserve better information as to what is going on. We were lied to that it was an HVAC problem. It is not an HVAC problem. You see the photos? That is not an HVAC problem. It is a mold problem. It goes deeper. Stop trying to give us canned answers as to what the problem is and be real with us. You are paying a consultant, demand a deadline for that report. You are entitled to a preliminary report, so this whole final report can't get it until then, that's a lie. This is part of what we do for a living. My job is an attorney, I do construction defect litigation. 
I know what you're entitled to. Start demanding better answers. The conditions for these kids is not okay. I demand better transparency from everybody involved into this is what's going on. As to co-teaching, shame on you for trying to put a Band-Aid on the problem and say everything is good. It is not okay. My daughter was part of the COVID problem. She has never had a normal school year, and this is what happens. Do not use those children's flexibility and their adaptability and their resilience against them. These teachers need better. It cannot be 40 plus kids in a classroom. That goes against co-teaching. You are on the borderline of explicitly violating Florida statute concerning what the legislative intent behind co-teaching was. It was to promote education. 40 plus kids in a classroom is not cutting it. You are not seeing the children when they come home. You are not seeing them drained day in, day out because of the chaos going in this room. So don't use it against them. Stop it. Listen to the teachers behind me. Listen to the parents telling you these conditions are not okay. Open up a town hall to the Evans parents. Allow us to give you some type of feedback as to the problem. This problem will not be resolved in a few months. Our kids are going to be subjected to this for some time. We need a solution to 40 plus kids next year. Months is not okay. Thank you. Order. Erica Stores, followed by Kristen Baer, followed by Hannah Long. Good evening, board members, and thank you for taking the time to hear what we have to say. I'm a first year teacher here at Seminole County Public Schools, and I have transferred after three years with Orange County Public Schools in Title I. Coming from that background, and much like my colleagues behind me, I have an immense love for my profession and an immense passion to advocate for my students. My fellow educators and I have been working tirelessly to ensure that our students still feel that they are safe, getting a quality education, and a normal school year. We've been doing it all while jumping through hoop after hoop and dealing with this continued mishigas of our concretables. Most recently, we've been given 15 minutes right before the first bell rang to move what was deemed essential after our remediation meeting from our concretables to our new temporary classrooms, then subsequently locked out of our classrooms and unable to re-enter them. We have not been and are still not given a time frame for when we will get back into our classrooms or even if the belongings that we left behind, the keepsakes, our appliances, our resources, any of this that's safe for us to get back into or take left with us. But our further communication for that matter was that our AC unit arrived, thank you for those, but honestly, that's not fixing the problem. We've been dealing with this and so much more that we don't have time to get into. While us nine educators who are in the concretables were displaced with our 18 plus students per class and have also displaced over nine other faculty in our, in our school and their students. It's a ripple effect. It's causing stress and tension, but we did it. We had to. We're professionals and we're not going to let the students know how much we are struggling, but please do not be mistaken. We are struggling. New students arrive, we worry about space in our already overcrowded classrooms, which is an awful environment for students who are overstimulated, uncomfortable transitioning back to a classroom environment, and easily distracted. The anxiety alone that we have seen in this change is palpable and honestly so disheartening for young children. To close, because I do not want to take time away, I, res I ask you respectfully, esteemed school board members, that in the future when an administrator or an educator asks you to take the time, I hope you'll listen carefully and respond with more urgency to an issue like air quality. Because my final thought for you is, after all you've heard and will hear from us, would you feel comfortable with your child being in our concretable? Thank you. My name is Kristen Bear. My son, Wyatt Bear, attends Evans. I'm here once again regarding Evans. Tonight, I would like to bring attention to the fact that while new AC units have been installed in the portable classroom since the last meeting, this does not address air quality concerns. My son is still ill. I have massive concerns for not only my child, but for every single child and teacher out in those portable classrooms. What have they been exposed to? 
The concerns in mold, of mold and humidity appear to be taking a backseat to the school's public image at this point. Communications about portable, portables are vague at best. We, the people, the teachers, the parents, have no information on a potential remedy for a problem that should have been fixed very long time ago. On top of the portables, there are also classrooms within the main building that still do not have AC. At this point, there is no excuse. They, you guys have been given way more than enough time to get this situation fixed. Why has the school facing a very busy public ro road received a remodel with new building to replace their portables, a playground remodel, new roads for their parking lot, while our private school on a small road, Evans, has received nothing. Now let's talk about this problem created by the administration's solution. 40 kids in a classroom. This is a detriment to these kids' education. My son is seven. Every single day he goes to school, he tells me, mom, I can't focus. Mom, it's too loud. Mom, please don't make me go to school today. Every single day I hear about these issues. My son is suffering massive anxiety regarding school. Seminole County has been one of the best school districts in Central Florida, and we expect so much from these children and teachers, and yet our solution to air quality issues and broken AC units is to put 40 kids in a classroom. This is not fair to teachers. It's not fair to students. Students can't focus, they cannot learn, and the teachers cannot adequately teach when they are be being forced to have 40 kids in one classroom. If you've ever been into a busy lunchroom, could you imagine how hard it would be to keep a room of 40 plus kids quiet at once? We must do better. The children deserve better, as well as these teachers that give their all to educate our children while getting treated as if Ms. their own Bear. safety and well-being does not matter. At any single teacher here tonight, how they feel about having 40 plus children in a class, I promise you they're gonna say they're overwhelmed, exhausted, frustrated, and at their wits end. Let's not lose the teachers we do have left. So much has been invested in these not standardized tests to measure how well these children are learning the curriculum. How about the money is spent Ms. and Bear, time is could spent. You please wrap it up. Thank how you. about the money and time is spent to get this issue resolved the right way. Order. Good evening, my name is Hannah Long and I'm a fourth grade teacher at Evans Elementary School. At the beginning of the school year, my partner and I had 23 and 24 students in our classrooms. Due to the air conditioning and mold issues at Evans Elementary School, Many classes have had to double up into one classroom. My partner teacher moved her class into my classroom to make room for two second grade classes to move into hers. Due to a student moving right after the merge, we now have 46 fourth grade students in one classroom. 46 fourth grade students in one classroom, 19.5% of whom who have a substantial reading deficiency. 46 fourth grade students in one classroom, 13% of whom are ELL students. 46 fourth grade students in one classroom, 17.3 of whom are ESE students. 46 fourth grade students in one classroom, 6% of whom have a 50 floor. How is this fair to these students? How am I supposed to be giving them my best when my small reading groups have 10 to 12 students each? 46 fourth grade students in one classroom, some of whom are the size of adults. 46 fourth grade students in one classroom, many of whom who no longer stand for the Pledge of Allegiance because they can't push their chair back far enough to stand up if the person behind them has already done so. 46 fourth grade students in one classroom who no longer get brain breaks while working because we don't have enough room for them to move around. 46 fourth grade students in one classroom who can no longer work collaboratively or in Kagan groups because there isn't a way for that many students to share their opinions without the volume level getting so loud that no one can hear. In the past week, we have had three students go to the clinic in my classroom alone due to minor injuries because we are so full. We're tripping over backpacks because we don't have enough hooks to hold them all and they fall off the chairs. Thankfully, so far, the injuries we've had have been minor. In 
In order for one student to use the restroom, everyone at the table behind them must scooch in their chairs so that very few, so that a few people, I'm sorry, so that a few people at that table can get up and let out the one person that needs to actually go. Five more students are having to move each time one needs to use the restroom. I'm sure you can imagine how distracting it is to the other 41 students in the room. Ms. Long, if you'd like to provide the rest of your comments to the board clerk, she'll share them with all of us. Not, I, I, I hardly have anything left. Okay. This is, these are my kids. <clears throat> these are my kids that I'm fighting for right now. During this time of togetherness, we've had people from the district stop in with school administration on two separate occasions. Both times, the students have quickly gotten quiet and appeared to be doing their best despite the circumstances. Of course they did. They're eight, nine, and 10 year olds. They know when important people walk through the room. I just wish my students felt important, not like sardines. In both visits, the people who entered only came five feet into the classroom and stayed less than five minutes. You can't get a sense of what it's really like in a classroom standing in the back for five minutes. I'd like to personally invite you to spend a day in my room if you truly think these students are adjusting nicely. Please come sit and spend a day with us. Try not to trip as you walk by. Try to concentrate on your emails with 46 bodies in such close proximity. Evans Elementary opened with 13 portables. We opened it that way. We have more students now. We deserve a PLC. We need a primary learning center. And at the very least, if there's a teacher shortage, that means there is a classroom overage. Somewhere in this county are portables that can be moved to our school so that our classrooms can be safe for these students. Because 46 kids in one room is not okay. Order, please. Allow the chairman to speak. Thank you. Adriana Silveria, Silveira, Danielle Rausch, Mary Rhodes. Good evening. My name is Ariadna Silveira, and I'm a second grade teacher at Evans. I also have two sons who attend Evans. I'm here to speak today on behalf of myself, my children, and my students and their families. In May of 2015, my son was diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder. We discovered his genetic mutation could have been from exposure to toxic environmental factors. This is where I learned how to advocate for those that I love and care for. Now that you know a bit of my background, let me explain what I'm advoca advocating for here today. As you can see, envir environmental factors are a bit of a sore subject for me as I have deep and personal experience with trauma my family endured possibly because someone did not do their job to ensure that the environmental safety, environmental safety was a priority. Please don't misunderstand. I am extremely grateful that the district has finally begun to clean up the disastrous state of the concretables. However, I am here because the conditions we are currently under are not much better and are affecting the mental health of students and teachers. I am currently teaching in a room with 39 children and one other teacher. I have 13 students that require specialized support. The data from the beginning of the year baseline tests show that 27 of my 39 students are reading one to two years below grade level. I believe this set of students has been the most affected by the pandemic, socially and academically. I have tried so hard this school year to offer the support needed and required of me but with 39 students who have yet to learn how to socialize appropriately, it has been overly challenging. And this is coming from someone who taught online, second grade online for a year. We owe them norm, a normal school year. We owe them a safe environment. We owe them the ability to learn freely without feeling like they need noise canceling headphones. I have two students who are diagnosed with generalized anxiety and they're having a hard time coming to school because it is just too much to handle. What will you do about this? When will we have our space back? When can we give the kids back their classrooms? When will I be able to teach under normal circumstances? Thank you. Order, please. Good evening, school board members and superintendent. My name is Danielle Rausch. I have a second grader at Evans Elementary. I recently sent an email to the school board and appreciate that you wrote back to me, but I asked for transparency for the test results and steps on what we're gonna take to 
remediate the outdoor classrooms with the results made public so we can independently review them to increase our confidence that the best solution has been implemented. The disrepair of these buildings did not happen overnight. Our outdoor classrooms have had issues with snakes, cockroaches, water infiltration, lack of air conditioning, high humidity levels in them, and potential for mold. I'm asking that you repair the outdoor buildings quickly and properly so that our second, third, and fourth graders can go back to normal class sizes. The 40 kids in my daughter's class is too much, and as we've heard, there's up to 46 in other classes. It causes too many distractions for our students, and it has drastically changed the learning environment for our students and teachers. I am also aware that the air conditioning in the main building and the first grade hallway has not been functioning properly since July. They are currently using portable air conditioning units that are noisy, distracting to students, and causing breathing problems to those that have compromised immune systems. I ask that you please consider involving parents more in this process so we can help work with the school and the school board along the way. Thank you for your time. Order, please. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Mary Rhodes from Evans Elementary. First, I'd like to thank Chairman Pennick and Deputy Superintendent Dr. Lysong for coming to school last week to see with your own eyes what our situation was due to our uncertain conditions in our concretables. One commented that it seems like the kids are handling the change very well. Well, that's due to the way that we approach joining the two classes to, to 40 students in one room. Some children are stressed and overwhelmed, but we have found ways to meet their needs. Just because it looks like the children are handling it well doesn't mean the situation is working. My teaching partner and I have tried many strategies while having 40 in the classroom. We tried one teacher teaching the whole group while the others proctor the room to do crowd control. We tried teaching a mini lesson and then going to centers due to the tight space, it turned into chaos. Then we decided to split the class into four groups of 10. My partner takes 10 students into the closet to give her lesson. I take 10 students to the floor to do my lesson well, while I supervise 20 students either on iReady or doing independent work. We then rotate four times in the day. Although direct instruction is our intention, non-interrupted learning is not taking place. Again, it may look like the children are handling it well, but we, are not found, we have not found a solution. We as teachers cannot meet the needs of our students. We can barely walk around the room without tripping over a chair. As of October 17th, teachers have not had access to our classrooms in the concretables. We were not given the appropriate amount of time to box up our personal items and take them home or place them in storage. Each teacher has invested thousands of dollars to create a learning environment that's welcoming and engaging. This looks exactly opposite of a public school funded classroom. When will the rooms be unlocked so our personal items can be secured? Why are our rooms still unavailable after eight days of no entry? Without an update on the progress taking place, we are left to assume the worst. Our county pledge has been one year's growth in one year's time. Due to COVID, now we're trying to do two years growth in one year's time. And it's, the learning environment doesn't get better. These children will be three years behind and the only thing that's increasing is their learning gaps. Please be respectful to us as teachers and our rightful concern we have. Please keep us informed about the progress, the testing, the results, and what companies you are using to help this situation. Your commitment and transparency in correcting building issues is appreciated. Thank you. Order. Jessica Tillman, followed by Allison Holmes. I'm Jessica Tillman, Seminole County resident. It's quite clear the superintendent follows policy when she wants to, but ignores when policies are not being followed. You can find funding for a $120,000 position, but you can't find funding to fix pay and real issues across the district. Disappointing to say the least. As I sat in the workshop this afternoon, I was quite shocked at the superintendent's response to board members who asked for books to be reviewed. She stated that the board can't request citing policy 2520, 
the board as a whole seems quite concerned with the content of these books. It seems the superintendent is more concerned with policies and procedures than the well-being of the students who have access to these books, which is what an attorney will do, right? The board gave clear direction to the superintendent to pull these books for review, and the superintendent said she needed a form from a parent or community member to, in, in order to start the process of review. Also stating the district does not own review process, it, it is, uh, it does its own review process every year, also stating it's an ongoing process. So if it's an ongoing process, why can't a board member request the district do what they are already doing and review these specific books? Policy 0169.1 needs to be discussed again, and the superintendent needs to give non-agenda items three minutes. Giving only two minutes for non-agenda items shows you don't care about issues in this community this, this community is facing. Even at the last meeting, everyone was going over because they were saying things that need to be heard. Please go back to three minutes for non-agenda items. Thank you. Order. Alison Holmes, Longwood, topic, defending SCPS. If I stop giving my kids fruit and vegetables because I thought each piece was slowly indoctrinating them with CRT, and then I managed to recruit a group of ignorant, big, bigoted misfits and persuaded them to start showing up to school board meetings to demand you stop giving any fruits and vegetables to any student at lunchtime because you're indoctrinating them. I wonder how long you'd um, indulge this group of misfits for. Not long, I bet. Yet we've been held hostage here for almost 18 months by homeschooling moms. Five minutes sometimes now. Of course, pandering to this group hasn't helped, and defending them over our students and staff is reprehensible. The homeschooling gang has wasted hours in these meetings, uh, pontificating about infectious diseases, telling us that their incalculable expertise in transgender healthcare, stating, telling us their knowledge or lack thereof on vaccines, and as for teaching, the Liberty Gang has forgotten more than our teachers could ever know. In fact, it's sheer luck that our school district ever got an A before Moms for Liberty showed up. I'm nervous about my son's future. If the Moms for Liberty people get elected, he needs board members who embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion. Inclusion is why he's at our local high school in a gen ed class. This isn't a woke agenda that kids need to be protected from. It's how civilized people live. I sincerely hope this cancer on our school district is eradicated on election day and we no longer have to hear Moms for Liberty standing up here, beating their chests, telling us they don't co-parent with the government. They don't because they homeschool. But guess what? Real parents in SCPS don't co-parent with Moms for Liberty. We never have, and we never will. Order. Order. That concludes public comment, and that concludes this meeting. So have a good evening. Thank you.